Today in studio, we're here to talk about uh, the affordable housing crisis. I'm uh, in studio with former executive director of Aon, uh, Alan Arthur, and executive director of Grassroots in Action, Artiste Mayfield. How are you guys doing today? Doing great, John. Great to be here. We're doing great. Good. Yeah. Thanks for coming. How did uh, How did you guys two meet? How did you two meet? So I guess I'll start. I was at an event AEI was having in the Alliance apartment, and we were all sitting at this table, and Alan walked into the room. And I looked at everybody at the table. I said, that's the boss. They was like, yeah. I said, you can't see? I said, look how he own in the room. <laughs> <laughs> and he looked over at our table, and he came over there, and he said, my name is Alan Arthur, and I'm the chief handshaker of <laughs> Chief, hey, li chief, li chief lip flapper and handshaker. <laughs> chief <laughs> flip flapper and handshaker. I said, I told you guys. These are the real titles the world never hears. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and that's how I met Alan Arthur. Awesome. And that's how I met Artiste uh, Irby then. Now, yeah, I was an Irby field. then. Yeah. All right. Um, cool. So um, can you briefly just uh, lay out the foundation of Aeon where it started? Um, what you do, and also like why uh, Aon was created. Yeah, John, that's a really good question. You know, Aon was originally Central Community Housing Trust, which is one of the uh, 11 planning communities in the city of Minneapolis. The city of Minneapolis had lost, uh, by, by the mid-1980s, had lost uh, uh, over 4,000 units of affordable housing that had been torn down over those a couple, three decades. And it was part of an urban renewal movement across the country to tear down older buildings. The problem is they were occupied with people who didn't have very big incomes, occupied by poor people. And so all those folks lost their housing. It was a big part of why homelessness started to increase in the, uh, in the, late, in the late 60s, 70s, and into the 80s. And it became, started becoming a crisis. And quite frankly, it's still with us today. And uh, so a group of volunteers, church folks and volunteers in downtown Minneapolis, um, beat up on the city council for knocking down some of that housing and uh, got the city council to set aside some money to replace it. And that's and then so then Central Community Housing Trust, which is now Aon, was formed in uh, February of 1986. Okay. Mm. So, question. Mm. Where do you find passion in your line of work? You, you know, um, I, <laughs> I'm asked that often. I think we learn... Um, I think we learn uh, that we should care about others. Some people don't learn it for some reason, but I learned it from my mother and my grandfather, frankly. I didn't know I was learning it at the time, but you watch them act, you know, in the world. You know, when I went to my mother's funeral, um, her memorial, two young people stood up and said, your mom saved my life. And uh, I was blown away. I didn't know she saved anybody's life. But what did she do? She just, uh, when they had troubles and they were had challenges in their lives, she would listen to them and, and help them as she could. You know, I know we always had kids over at our house who weren't part of our family but needed a place to stay, and they would be at our house. And we just thought it was normal and natural, and I just think that's, you learn that kind of behavior, and I think that's where I got it. I've always seen, <clears throat> excuse me, your passion, and I'm very teachable. So <clears throat> watching you provides a lot of growth to my life and makes me take responsibility <laughs> <laughs> for myself and the things that I have did as well as to continue doing. Well, you know, Artista, I, you've always heard me say that I'm the luckiest man in the world. <laughs> and I, I feel I am because the people I know and... Uh, people who teach me, you know, every day, actually, um, and insist sometimes that I do better as well. Um, can you explain the affordable housing crisis briefly? Yeah, it's really, a, it's pretty simple. Um, for some reason in this country and other countries, in this society, in this civilization, we have accepted that a large share of our population shouldn't have resources that allow them to live reasonable lives. Um, 
about a third in this country, in this state, for example, about a third of wage earners are not paid anything close to a living wage. Um, you know, they're not paid or don't have access to resources that will allow them to have reasonable health care, uh, education, mm -hmm. reasonable place to live. Yeah. And so, to me, that's exploitation mm -hmm. when we allow that to happen. So basically, for 100 years, 200 years, maybe 700, maybe 1,000 years, we've allowed a large share of our population to be exploited, economically exploited. Can we talk a little bit about like some of the specifics of that? I Just like sure. rudimentary research I'm looking at, um, let's say like Minneapolis just passed a $15 minimum wage. I That's think. laughable. Yeah, it's a it's kind yeah. of a slap in the face. We've been talking about it for 10 years. If yeah. We, if we'd passed $15 10 years ago, that'd been fine. But now it should be $22. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really ridiculous. It like it feels yeah. like a joke. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm looking at like median income, right? Um, 35,000, maybe 33. city of Minneapolis. In right? the city, yes. Yeah. Um, the median cost of a single bedroom apartment is 1265 for a studio, it's like 1,000 something. Now, if you're making $15 an hour, that's 65% of your annual that's income right, after taxes. That's right, John. Um, if you're making $20 an hour, that's still over 50. Financial advisors recommend that rent doesn't take up more than 30% right. of your income. So we're setting people up to fail. That's that right. is a blatant failure of our it's current approach to this and we're not treating it with the urgency that it deserves no we're not and you speak about urgency if you think about it you know governor walls has in front of him a budget that he's working on uh he's got what 17 billion dollars to figure out how to spend and my message to him would be uh, let's talk about what people human beings need to live air okay so if you want to spend some of that on clean air good go for it water sure we should have clean water and access to it food Absolutely, all our, all our people should be able to have healthy food. Right after that is home, mm -hmm. housing, home. And uh, if we don't spend a good chunk of what we're raising in taxes, uh, if we don't restructure the way our economy works so that people can have those four things to start out, then we're not doing the right thing. Yeah. Who is hit the hardest by this issue? Well, poor people, of course, are hit the hardest. Uh, and continue to be hit the hardest. And when we have housing problems of any kind, it's the folks at the bottom who uh, start getting solutions last and uh, start going into the hole first. And that's the way it is and has been. Uh, I will say this, that the federal government actually had a great program uh, in the, before about 1985 that allowed us to build affordable housing at a great scale. And before then, homelessness was actually you know, reasonable, under reasonable control. I often hear people tell me, Artiste and John, that uh, homelessness has always been with us and it will always be with us. And uh, I almost use a bad word, but I'd say BS, <laughs> because in my lifetime, homelessness not, has not always been with us. Not like we have it today. Were there homeless guys riding the rails? Sure. But in my, when I grew up, there were no homeless families. There were not homeless children in our communities. But uh, about in the mid-'80s, we started uh, moving away from helping at any great scale those folks who needed the help. And we continued to depress wages at the bottom, and that is where we are today. In your era, you said that— it, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in well, your like era— Like 47, right? <laughs> oh, I love you, John. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a suck-up. <laughs> <laughs> so in your era, you didn't see homelessness— it was homelessness, or we can say that the places that people lived, you might as well have been homeless. Like in New York, for example, how the slum lords, the rats, sure. and the that ate people up. You know, um, so to me, it was still some form of homelessness back then. It's just created to a bigger mess. No question. And. I was going to, oh, another question I was going to ask you, what do you think is the root cause of this problem? Let me say this one thing. We have offered lots of people housing, like even in the hotels when we were allowing the hotel uh, people to, had opened the hotels for people to come in and live, they just tore it up. You know, it seems sometimes, they tore up majority of the hotels, they tore up the one on Franklin, 
in uh, no Lake Street in Chicago. They tore up one downtown on Nicollet. You know, it was just things that were given to people that were homeless, but they didn't seem to want to embrace it. What do you think was the cause of this, or do you think um, that the uh, problem is is because people don't mind being homeless? No, I don't think any, not very many people mind, want to be homeless. I don't, I don't think that's the case. I, I will say that um, you ask about the cause. Well, as a problem, it's an economic problem fundamentally. I would guess that 90% of the folks would, would fix the problem if they had a steady income of $100,000 a year. You know, I'm not proposing that that be done exactly that way, but I'm just saying that people would sort out the problems they have if they had the resources and wherewithal to do it. Not all of them would. I've got some brothers that might not, uh, but uh, m most would if they had the ability to have the resources to, to fix it and to figure it out. But there's a difference between the, what is the fundamental problem and what is the cause or the root cause of it. The root cause, there's not probably one root cause. There's, but it's fundamentally an economic problem, an economic inequity or set of economic inequities. I sometimes again refer to it as economic exploitation or economic oppression, uh, where a large chunk of our population is expected to uh, participate in the economy uh, in return for not enough resources to live a good life. And that is to the benefit of the folks who have lots of money and lots of resources, more than they, far more than they need. But there are other uh, causes. I mean, there's no question in the housing arena that racism in this country probably prevents us from latching on to the solutions we need to latch on to. So it's an economic problem, but there are solutions to that economic problem. But you know, things like racism and classism keep us as a, as a body, as a country, as a civilization from latching on to the, the solutions that would fix that problem. So it's a multi-tiered multi problem. Do you, do you think it's fair to say that a large part of wage stagnation uh, is occurring because of policy decisions that were built to help the wealthy and powerful oh yeah and it hurt the average worker like that's kind of a big picture my, from my perspective oh yeah, yeah. A absolutely and you could name many many things the mortgage interest interest deduction where you know i get a tax a big tax break uh, for owning my own home and buying my home and getting a mortgage uh, and uh, folks who can't buy a home don't get that break so i'm basically getting money from the government to help support my home and people at the bottom are not right right um this other question, too, is, like, at the Salvation Army, we find people housing. Some of them don't want it. And that's what I was kind of saying. Like, we'll find them housing, and some of them we just can't get to go. They just want to stay right there. And even the tents, the people that are ganging up in the tents and um, putting up tents. Remember when they went to make a move, they did not want to go. Some of them even didn't even want to go to the places they had for them to go, even when it was cold outside. And I just try to think about, is it because they like the, um, that's their pleasure, that's their- um, That's what they know, I think, that's, Ortiz. That's, that's what, what they, they know. know. And uh, their kids are growing up with that's what they know too, you yes. know? And so I think though still most of them, we have to be careful not to um, paint everybody who's in that situation with the same brush uh, that those particular folks you're talking about may be in. Um, again, I think if given a place that they feel safe and warm and uh, fed and healthy, uh, I think most people would eventually and maybe pretty quickly gravitate to having a home. And I think maybe like the availability of guidance, uh, resources, services sure. that can yeah, help. Yeah, and you know, there's you know. there's mitigating factors like chemical dependency mm -hmm. and alcoholism and a whole bunch of things yeah. that, of course, but you know, but it, uh, fundamentally, it's not caused. I, I often have uh, people tell me, "Oh well, homelessness is caused by uh, drug addiction and alcoholism, et cetera." I say that can't be true, and they say, "Well, why?" 
I said, well, a good chunk of our attorneys and our doctors have alcohol, are alcoholics and drug users, and they're not homeless. Mm -hmm. So it can't be the cause. It might be a contributing factor, yeah. but it can't be the cause. Right. I remember when I um, also first spoke at one of your events, and I talked about Alliance was my first apartment ever. Mm. And when I walked into the apartment, I had my own bathroom, I had my own bed, <laughs> I had my own stove, refrigerator, and I just sat there, I was numb. And I was 45 years old. And that was my first apartment. And I told that story at that event. Mm -hmm. It was um, emotional. And I asked myself, why did it take me to, this long to get here? What do you, like, what were the specific feelings you had first? This is your first time having your own space. Like, can you get a little more into like how that felt and how it changed the way you were looking at how you approach your life? So was it was that a like, I felt worthy. Hmm. I felt that I deserved to Ben had my own space. I just didn't know how to get there. Yeah, Artiste, I, I remember some you know discussions that you and I had back in those during that time or, or shortly after that time. And uh, I think you kind of went back and forth in some ways. I think some days you felt you deserved it and should have it, and other days you felt you didn't deserve it. Right. So I think there was a mix, wasn't there? It, there, there definitely was a mix. But I finally got it and said, you know, I am worthy, but that was, I think that's because when, it, when I came there, my self-esteem was low mm. to the ground. And as I began to pick it up, I began to realize that I am worthy. I was in between at first because my self-esteem still right. kept stepping in. Right. You know, it is not unusual when, uh, at Aon when we would open up uh, housing for homeless folks. Um, we opened one up not uh, a few years ago for homeless seniors, for seniors, <clears throat> many of them who had been homeless. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, it's not unusual for you to walk in during that first day when people are moving in and see a whole bunch of people crying, weeping, weeping with joy, yeah. just weeping, just the emotions over, overwhelming them uh, because it's inconceivable that they went from where they were to having a decent place that they might if they, if they can just stay. And, they're, and they're, of course, they're often worried that they might be kicked out tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> if they can just stay, that they might have a chance to make home for themselves. I think these are like the types of stories, the like human experience that's so horribly overlooked or ignored in the policymaking process back to like, why aren't we treating this more as a more urgent issue? Right. These are the types of uh, impacts that correcting the problem could be and that should be the value we are seeking not not dollar bills you know for right, for the wealthy it's it's about the people who are ju <laughs> just tr trying to make make a basic living you know like we're not being given much to work with here that's right but we don't have to be depressed, so like, let's talk about solutions. Um, I don't know, like a uh, hundred come to mind. Uh, Alan, I, I feel like you're, you're the expert here. Like, what do you think the viable like steps we can take right now? Like, what would that path look like? Yeah, um, well, again, it's an economic problem from a technical standpoint. Of course, as a social problem, uh, the symptoms or the impacts are social and human. Mm -hmm one on our families, our children, our seniors, our vets, um, our individuals who are out there with uh, many challenges in their lives. But it's an economic, the, the solutions are mostly economic and uh, the interesting thing is I don't think we have to do things dramatic. We have to change the direction of the boat. Mm -hmm. We have to head the boat in the right direction. That, that starts not giving rich people and rich corporations giant tax breaks instead of using that money to provide affordable housing for people or to provide um, additional income for people below certain levels. If we, if we refuse to pay people over a certain amount of money f for their wages, then there are proposals out there to do a basic living wage for everybody. 
There, it's going to be an economic problem because housing does cost something to build. It has a as a resource. It is some. It costs something to run or build, whether it's home ownership or rental. Doesn't matter. It's still a something that costs, and so somebody's got to pay that bill. And if if we insist on keeping a third of the population below the level that can can adequately pay for that, then we have to figure out how we supplement them on the back side. We can either supplement them by having more affordable rents, more affordable housing, or more income in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, those are all the, as I say to friends in the industry, any proposal that does one of those two things, I'll support. Mm-hmm. So it could be um, going back to Section 8 program. We, we still have basically the same number of Section 8s that we had in 1985. Can you explain Section 8 really quick yeah, for viewers or listeners who might <clears throat> yeah, not? Thank you. Section 8 is a rental subsidy program at the federal level that pays the difference between what a, what a family can afford to pay for rent and what the actual rent is in the marketplace. And so if they can afford to pay 600 and the rent's 1200 then the, the Section 8 rental subsidy pays the other 600 And it, it was a big and important program in the early 80s and through the mid-80s, and then uh, government started to freeze it. And so we were a country of 240 million people in, in 1985, and now we're a country of 325 million people with the same amount of Section 8s. That was a big problem. If we fix that, it would go a long way for helping folks at the bottom. Yeah. So are there examples of communities that have successfully addressed this problem, either in the U.S. or internationally? No, not uh, not dramatic success anywhere, really. Every country has this problem and has had this problem for a long time. There's some countries in Europe that have more powerful social programs. But take uh, uh, Great Britain, for example. It had a very healthy public housing program for many, many years, but in the last 10 years they've been trying to kill it. Wow. And so the problem exists uh, basically across the, across the world. Do you think there is a solution to this problem? There is. Again, it's uh, fixing the, some combination of fixing the uh, income inequities, income disparities, and uh, the cost of housing for a third of our population. Right. So like raising the minimum wage would be an example. I I mean, after the last 10 years, how they acted on 15, like we talked about, uh, you know, I don't know what needs to happen, but that is. A- yeah, and there, it's you know it would take a more in-depth conversation about that, which I like that conversation. I love to be engaged in that conversation because it does have implications economic for our for our economy as well. And but there's ways to think about that. As a matter of fact, I have a call in to uh, Neil Kashkari, the head of the Federal Reserve here. I'm trying to meet him for lunch to see if uh, he can explain to me why he insists on uh, certain policies that aren't beneficial to people at the bottom of the income ladder. Who has the power to fix it? Well, it's easy to blame uh, public policymakers, but we elect them. (laughs) So so we the people. So (laughs) voters have the power, right? I like that. Uh, We the the voters have the power to fix this. That's right, Uh the the people. We can't get that message across enough. That's basically the the That's what you guys are doing, isn't it? That's what we do. (laughs) Got to show up, get the right people in, and then then it's about holding them accountable, too. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think we're, we're just going to close out on a personal note. Um, Alan, um, what, what do you think somebody can do on an individual level? I know we just said vote, but like on an individual level, if they're trying to get involved or get their bearings on how to address issues like affordable housing, what do they do first? Or like, where should they look for guidance? Uh, they should join you guys first, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was fishing. Be, be a member. Yeah, be a grass member. roots in action. There grass roots go. in action. I'd say get engaged in whatever way works for you, whether big or small. I think learning about the subject. I mean, there's so much misinformation, quite frankly, on all poles of this subject. Um, there's a misunderstanding of how housing works in general, how real estate works in general, and a capitalistic world which we are in and we have to understand how that works if we're going to try to fix it so. education again education yes, it's key um great um well i really appreciate you coming on i'd love to have you back to talk about uh minimum wage or other approaches to to the affordable housing more specifically love to come back awesome. and thanks alan for coming out 
My pleasure always, Artiste. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right, that's a wrap. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys.